to be hosting Jim Quick for this Talks at Google. I am a director in Google Labs, uh, leading teams that are building some new AI-enabled products and features for Google. Uh, before I officially welcome Jim, I want to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Jim, as I think many of you already know, is a widely recognized expert in brain performance, mental fitness, and memory improvement. And in addition to the name Jim Quick being very on brand for what he talks about, um, yes, it is his real name, so we can just eliminate that question from the Q&A now. Um, he's got some very personal experience with this area of brain performance uh, because he had a childhood brain injury that really left him with some learning challenges. And because of that, Quick started creating strategies that dramatically enhanced his own cognitive performance. And since then, he's dedicated his life to helping others unleash their true genius and brain power. Jim is the founder of Quick Learning, which is an online accelerated learning academy with students in 195 countries. And last I counted, that means he is literally reaching all ends of the globe, which is pretty cool. Uh, he's the author of the number one Wall Street Journal bestseller and also New York Times bestseller called Limitless, a book called Limitless, Upgrade Your Brain, Learn Anything Faster, Unlock Your Exceptional Life. And he's actually got an expanded version uh, coming out, so y'all can check that out. And to top that all off, uh, he's also the host of the Quick Brain podcast, uh, which has tens of millions of downloads. And his mission is No Brain Left Behind. Jim is gonna be giving a talk and then we'll open it up to audience Q&A, both via the Dory for folks listening online and also in person. Uh, and uh, you can add your questions uh, that way or line up at the mics at the end. And please uh, join me in welcoming Jim Quick to Talks at Google. So uh, today in today's session, I want to share with you some of the research we've been, uh, that led to this book and uh, share with you how to unleash what I call your limitless mind to be able to, my, my area of expertise is in that of brain optimization and accelerated learning. How many of you feel like you want a better brain? Raise, raise, your, raise your hand. All right, nobody wants a, a worse brain, right? <laughs> How many of you feel like you could benefit from learning even faster and keeping up with all the information you need to, to keep up with? Raise your hand. How many of you have books on your shelf you haven't read yet? And it becomes shelf help, not self help, right? Uh, anybody here came here today like to have a better memory? Raise your hand. How many of you forgot why you came here today? <laughs> have you ever done that? Have you ever walked into a room of your own home and just forgot why you're there? Does anyone feel a little bit absent-minded, like senior moments are coming way, way too early? Like maybe you read a page in a book, get to the end, and just forgot what you just read? Um, or do you know somebody who misplaces things all the time? Like their wallet, their purse, their cell phone, their car keys. If not their car keys, something much larger like their car. <laughs> you ever see the people in the, in the parking lot using their car alarm, like GPS, trying to figure out where they parked the car that day? Um, and how about names and faces? Have you ever met somebody, you got their name, and then seconds later, the name just uh, disappeared out of your mind? And you, you wonder where it went. As soon as the handshake breaks, it just like falls right to the floor. Um, let's, let's start with my name. Hopefully you remember it after today. <laughs> my name is Jim Quick of Quick Learning, and I help people to learn quickly. Um, uh, Quick really is my last name. I didn't change it to do what I do. It's my father's name, my grandfather's name. You could say my destiny was pretty much planned out. I had to be a runner back in school. There's a lot of pressure when it says Quick right on your shirt. Um, and I have to be careful when I'm driving because the worst name to have on your driver's license, uh, you know, when you get pulled over for speeding is the name Quick because you're not going to talk your way about a speeding ticket. Um, and I get to do my, my mission in life, which is teaching people to learn faster. I think if there's one skill to master in the 21st century that will give you an incredible advantage, it's your ability to learn faster and, and translate that learning into action, right? Because if you could focus and re retain and read faster, understand more, think faster, clearer, remember more, what can you apply that to? Everything, right? It, it could be machine learning, money, management, martial arts, music. You know, anything gets medicine. Everything gets easier when you could learn how to learn quickly. And that's what I want to share with you today. So I'm going to just uh, share with you some tips out of, out of this out of this book. The the, the book's called uh, Limitless: Upgrade Your Brain, Learn Anything Faster, and Unlock Your Exceptional Life. And I use the word exceptional because I was definitely not exceptional as a, as a child. 
you know, I, I hung out with the, the kids that, that love to, uh, to play Dungeons and Dragons or read comic books, play video games, um, but they were just really, the difference was they were really exceptional. They, they had the grades and, you know, I was, you know, one of those people who had uh, learning difficulties. You know, I had a traumatic brain injury when I was five years old. I had a very bad fall. I was rushed to the emergency room, uh, blood, you know, covered in blood, and just my parents said I was just different after that. Before I was very playful and energized and curious, but I came, I became very shut down, and I had these severe processing issues, where uh, teachers would repeat themselves over and over again, and then I would learn to pretend to understand, but I didn't understand. And so I had poor focus, poor memory. It took me three years longer just to learn how to read like all the other kids. Uh, when I was nine years old, I was slowing down the class and I was being teased more that day than other days. And a teacher came to my defense and she pointed to me and said, leave that kid alone. That's the boy with a broken brain. You know, and so that label became my limit. And so I struggled. So that's kind of where, where I came from. Um, my parents immigrated to the US and so you know we didn't have a whole lot. Um, we live in the back of a laundromat that my mom worked at, and uh, you know, and so at that same time, because my parents had so many jobs, my grandmother, uh, who was raising me, she passed of Alzheimer's, and so that's why I'm just very passionate about brain health and education. So that's kind of like like my why, and you know, our mission is to build better, brighter brains, right? You know, no brain left behind, you know, and so that's really our goal. So I encourage you to take some notes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this more, um, not so much a lecture. I have a couple of slides that might be relevant, but I, I really wanna give you some tactical things that you hear, people watching you know, uh, on video, that they could do that are uh, science-based ways to be able to improve your productivity, your own personal performance, maybe give you even some, some peace of mind also, also as well. So I tend to go in acronyms and I, I cause I feel like in a short period of time I have somebody, you know, having these like kind of mnemonic uh, kind of tricks, you know, very simple uh, ways of, of encoding information and just kind of retrieving it out again. So if you wanna raise your hand again, if you like to learn a subject faster and uh, more thoroughly, right? It, it could be any subject or any skill, right? Cause the human mind is the ultimate adaptation machine. So I'm gonna give you a very quick one, and it's, this is, I just want to remember be fast. All right, so you can spell be fast. I'm gonna turn into an acronym, and these are some of the fundamentals, you know, we're gonna talk about tips that could dramatically improve your performance. So the B in be fast stands for, you have to start with belief, right? If you believe you can or you believe you can, either way, what? You're right, right? Henry Ford said that. So what would you define as, as a belief? Like how would, how would you define the word belief? What, what, what is it? I know this is a high performance group here. It's, it's, a, it's a what? It's, a, it, it's, it's an idea that you have some kind of certainty. It's something that you're giving energy that you hold as, as true. Let me, let me show you what a belief is real, real quick. Um, st stand up, stand up for me. And I know, I know some of you have computers, just put it to the side. And you're like, oh, he's one of those guys. <laughs> and just make some distance for the person next to you. And you can do this wherever you're watching this right now. I encourage you to do this because learning is not a spectator sport, right? And so I really want to get into your body, right? You, you could get lectured to all the time, but there's a learning curve, but there's also a forgetting curve. If you learn something passively and you hear it just once on a podcast or from a presentation or from a book, within 48 hours, how much do you forget on average? What does research show? Just guess a percentage. What would you guess is, is forgotten? Yeah, 80%. Yeah, 80%, right? And so one of the ways to mitigate that is, is to get, create an experience for yourself. So this, this is what a belief is to me. Uh, shake out your body. Well, first of all, you know, as, you move, as your body moves, your brain grooves. So this is an area of science called educational kinesiology. So I want everyone to take their, their hand or their elbow and then just touch the opposite knee. And just kind of go back and forth. We're getting this on video, right? <laughs> There's like cameras everywhere. <laughs> All right, so you could go, so these are, in education, these are called cross crawls. And so as your body moves, your brain grooves. Before I get on a computer or I go into a meeting, I'll activate more of my brain. And this has been shown to actually improve communication between your left and your right hemispheres of your brain. And whenever you're crossing the midline, that's why crawling for children is so important for brain development. Because the primary reason you have a brain is to control your movement. But it's not, a, it's not a, just a mind-body connection. There's a body-mind connection that by using your body in certain ways, it actually stimulates more, more, uh, more connections. Let's do this. 
massage your earlobe with your opposite hand, and then do the other one. And what I want you to do is take a deep breath and just, just squat down, inhale, and then exhale and come on up. Inhale, go down. Exhale, come on up. <laughs> Photos, please. Inhale, go down. <laughs> exhale, and then one more time with a big smile on your face. And what does that have to do with speed reading? Exhale, come on up. All right, shake out your body. So just remember this. As your body moves, your brain grooves, right? You know, sometimes it's when you're on screens all the time, it's important to take a five-minute brain break you know, to hydrate, to maybe to get some oxygen in your body, and to move your body. When you move your body, you create brain-derived neurotropic factors, BDNF, which is like fertilizer for neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, all right? But let me go back to the power of belief. So shake out your body, keep your feet stationary, and what I want you to do with your right hand is point forward with your right hand. And do this on video also, wherever you're doing this, so you can own this. Right hand, good. And what I want you to do without moving your feet, turn to your right, and go as far as you could go and notice where you're pointing. Like take a mental screenshot of where you're pointing, snapshot. As far as you could go, great. All right, come back center. Now empty your hands and just put your hands by your side. Don't hold them together, don't put them in your pocket, but just keep them by your side. I want you to take a deep breath, exhale, and close your eyes and just breathe normally. And I'm gonna walk you through a quick 30 second visualization, a mental exercise. I want you as you're breathing normally, to imagine you're pointing forward with your right hand, but this time, see and feel yourself going twice as far as you did the first time. See and feel in your body what it feels like to go twice as far, like you're made out of rubber. And if you can't imagine it, imagine you can imagine it, all right? Now again, with your eyes closed, see and feel yourself going three times around. One, two, three. And then one more time with a big smile on your face, thinking, what does that have to do with my memory? See and feel yourself going four times around, like you're uh, Mr. Fantastic or you're Gumby. One, two, three, four. Creating a great stretch. All right, watch this. Open your eyes, point forward with your right hand, and now turn to your right as far as you could now go. Wait, wow. Clap if you went further the second time. All right, have a seat. So my, my question for you, ra raise your hand, look at your neighbors. How, how, how many of you went further the second time? Raise your hand, look around. Now my question for you is the obvious. Were you physically capable of turning that far the first time? N like nobody took a yoga class when my eyes are closed, right? You're physically capable. Where was the limitation if there was one? In, in your mind, right? And you could say, I didn't have a belief on how far I could turn. How many beliefs do you think you have? Right? You have these countless beliefs. And then please write this down. So one of the first principles of, of this research, of the book, of performance, it's all behavior is belief driven. All behavior is belief driven. If you want to create a new result in your work, in your life, you need to do a new behavior. In order to do that new behavior, you need a belief that allows that to be possible. Does that make sense? You know, somebody in the hallway before I got on, so it's like, saying, yeah, you know, I'm glad, you, I know you're a memory coach, you know, I have a horrible memory. And I was like, stop. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them, right? That makes sense, right? Your brain is this incredible supercomputer and your self-talk is a program it will run. So if you tell yourself, I'm not good at remembering people's names, you will not remember the name of the next person you meet because you program your supercomputer not to. Does that make sense? So we've discovered more about the human brain probably in the past 20 years than the previous 2,000 years. What we found is we're grossly underestimating our, you know, our, our own potential, right? Our own capable, what we could really, what we're really capable of. And so, you know, when we're talking about this, part of this is just understanding our thoughts, that we have 60,000 thoughts a day, and the problem is 95% of the thoughts we have today are the same thoughts we had yesterday and the day before that. So it's really hard to make a new change in your life if, you have, if you're doing the same, level, same, same thinking, right? So that, because that would be insanity. So the goal is to be able to reframe this a little bit. So maybe you find yourself saying, I don't have a great memory, but then you say like the word yet, right? Let me, let me give you another example. In, in the book, I talk about the four digital supervillains that hold you back, that really interrupt your productivity and your performance. And technology didn't create these issues, it just amplified. One of them is digital deluge, right? The amount of information is doubling at dizzying speeds, but how we learn it, read it, is the same. So that growing gap creates stress, right? Information anxiety. Second one is digital distraction. 
right? How do you maintain your focus in a world full of rings and pings and dings and app notifications? So on social media alerts, I just get dizzy even just thinking about all, all these things, right? So that's distraction. And then we talk about digital deduction where for the first time this generation, uh, upcoming generation, they have less uh, rational ability, critical thinking on previous generations and they're attributed a little bit to technology because with algorithms, you know, we don't have to think as much, right? Because we're being told what to think, right? And, not, and so we're not really thinking about how to think. And then the other one I want to address here is digital dementia. And this is a term in healthcare that says because of the high reliance on technology, we don't have to remember hardly anything, right? How many, and I'm giving, I'm in my 50s, right? But so I was going to give away my age, like my little wherever I am. But how many of you growing up used to know a lot of, how many phone numbers did you know growing up? How many? A ton, right? Dozens, right? So you knew, like, how many, how many, like, you still remember some of those numbers, right? But how many current numbers do you know today? Three. <laughs> and that's a lot, right? And so, I, and I don't want to memorize 500 phone numbers, right? But it should be concerning we've lost the ability to remember one, or a PIN number, or a passcode, or a seed phrase, right? Or something we just, uh, someone, some, something, something just told us, right? Or a conversation, or what we're going to say, or somebody's name, right? And, and please write this down when it comes to your beliefs around memory. There is no such thing as a good or bad memory. There's a trained memory and an untrained memory. We just, we didn't have any classes on how to, like in school they teach you what, three R's. What are the three R's in school? Reading, writing, arithmetic, right? Spelling obviously is not, not one of them. But what about recall? What about retention? Socrates said learning is remembering. I believe two of the most costly words sometimes are I forgot. I mean, think about the consequence. I forgot to do it. I forgot to bring it. I forgot that meaning. I forgot what I was going to say. I forgot that person's name. On the other side, when you could remember things, life gets so much easier. We can remember product information, you know, coding, uh, client information, you know, give speeches without notes. You know, life gets a lot easier. So anyone could do that. We just weren't taught because there are no classes on this. But let's give an example. We talked about numbers, and there's no such thing as a good or bad memory. Let's, let's train our memory. Let's do some exercises. Let's, let's train ourselves, let's practice with, let's use a number, right? Let's come up with a number for the group, everybody here watching and everybody here in the room to collectively memorize that number, right? Let, let's, because we haven't done this for so long. So this is like a little memory exercise. And so what we'll do is, let's do, uh, just raise your hand and then shout out, you know, a two digit number. Like I'll start 21, right? So everybody, and actually write this down, because you, you, <laughs> why don't you write this down so you can test yourself, so someone should write this down. You can open up your phone, open up a little, uh, like a little notepad, and then write 21. And we'll come up with a, a decent sized number, and then do the best you can to memorize this list together. Does that make sense? How many of you have a little anxiety around this already? <laughs> all right, perfect. So I'll start 21, all right? So just raise your hand, and just give me a, a two digit, a two digit number. 86, so I'll, I'll repeat it just so everybody's on the same page and do this at home also, and you can write it down, but also do your best to kind of rehearse it, memorize it, whatever, notice your current strategy for how you, you know, how you start this. Yes? 43. 43. 43. Yes? 50. 50. Very good. So we, we left with what, 43 and we did 50? Perfect. 63, great. How many single digits are, is that already? Single digits. 10, okay. So how, do you feel like you have the first 10? I mean, that's, that's a phone number, right? That's an area code and, and a phone number here in the States. So, so we're, we're good. So last one was 63. All right, let's, let's keep on going. Let's, let's stretch our memory a little bit. Let's see, see how, how many, what our limits are. Keep going. If we're having trouble coming up with numbers, I have to take this talk into a diff, totally different direction. <laughs> Yes, 98, 98, very good, bingo, <laughs> yes, 72. 72. See, I want you to see like where your threshold is. Where do you feel like, okay, I had it up to now, but now it's getting a little bit, are, are we on the fringe here a little bit? Or have we, we passed it a while ago? <laughs> All right, good, yes, 11. So last one was 72, this one is 11. I should be actually, I should be memorizing this with you. <laughs> yes. 25. 25. All right. Okay. So the, are, are we getting, how many people feel like they, they know this, this list 
so far? OK. <laughs> All right, this is good then. This is perfect. Oh, let's, let's do another one, number. Yes? 17. 17. All right, how many single digits are we up to now? We're at 20 already? And the last one was 17? OK, let's, um, let, let's, 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 keep, let's keep going. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes? 14? OK, 14. Great. OK, more. <laughs> yes? 44. All right, 44. Another one? Yes? 99. Perfect, 99. Um, all right, let's just do two, two more. Yes? 37. 37. All right. And then one more, just for time's sake. Yes? 48. OK, perfect, 48. All right, so how many single digits is that now? I'm, I'm, I can't count out in front of me. Four, about 30? 30 single, 30 numbers? All right. How many of, uh, now the notice, just do an assessment here, because you don't know how good your memory is until you kind of test it, right? So you're looking at these numbers, notice how you went about you know, your approach towards memorizing it, and uh, let's see how many we remember, all right? Maybe I'll, uh, I'll start, I'll start, okay? Um, so, wait, I need some encouragement here. <laughs> um, all right, let's see how many, how many we'll, be, we'll go through it together. Maybe I'll ask you some of them also as well. So single digits was uh, two, one, yes, <laughs> eight, six, four, three, five, zero, six, three, nine, eight. How am I doing? Okay, seven, two, one, one, two, five, one, seven, one, four, 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 nine, nine. Is that right? Three, seven, four, eight. All right. Backwards. I, mean, I could try it backwards. How many of you want me to see? Anyone you know, try doing it backwards? Can I have some encouragement again? This was a lot harder. All right, ready? Here it goes. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking. Um, actually, let me, let me, let me try it uh, backwards. So we have eight, four, seven, three, nine, nine, four, four, uh, four, one. Yes? Seven, one, five, two, one, one, two, seven, uh, eight, nine, three, six, zero, five, three, four, uh, six, eight, one, two. All right. So I, I do this kind of quickly, um, not, not, not at all to impress you, but more to express to you was what's possible. You know, because the truth is all of you could do this also, regardless of your age, your background, your career, your education level, your financial situation, gender, history, IQ. We all could do it, we just weren't taught, right? Um, in fact, I feel like we're taught a lie, that somehow our memory is fixed like, uh, like our shoe size. And, and the truth is, you know, with neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, we could, you know, our brains could grow older, but in a lot of ways it could grow better. Right? And so I'm going to share with you some of those strategies. But the reason I do this, the, we know this, this training, some of you went 25, 50% further when we did a turning exercise. Did you work harder the second time? No, but you went 25, 50% further. And so you didn't work harder. It, it didn't require any more effort. But I'm curious, because it was, a, it was a belief issue, in what area could you go 25, 50% further without exerting more effort and resources? Right? Where is it, could there potentially be a mental block, what I call a lie, a limited idea entertained that, you know, whether it's in your impact, whether it's in your performance, your happiness, your reading speed, you know, your income, whatever it happens to be, where do you feel kind of contained in, in a box? So I, I wrote Limitless as to be an owner's manual for your brain, because your brain is your number one wealth building asset. Nobody here who's watching this right now is paid like it was hundreds of years ago for your brute strength. Today it's your brain strength. Right? It's not your muscle power, today it's your mind power. Right? And today knowledge is not only power, knowledge is profit. There's a, there's a quote in Limitless from a French philosopher that says, life is the letter C between B and D. Life is C between B and D. And you can write this down. Life is the letter C between B and D. B is birth, D is death, life C, choice. 
Like our lives are the sum total of all the choices we've made up to this point, right? Where are we gonna live, who are we gonna spend time with, where are we gonna work, where are we gonna eat today, what are, all these different things, right? So I believe these difficult times, they could diminish you, these difficult times, they could distract you, or these difficult times, they could develop you. We ultimately decide. I'm gonna share some of those choices you can make you know, uh, today for a better brain. So this exercise also we did, this turning exercise, this visualization, it's not just, uh, you know, athletes also do that, right? They don't just physically train, they do what? They do mental training. You know, what did Roger Bannister do in the early 50s? He, he broke the what? The four minute mile. Throughout human history, thousands of years, nobody could run a mile sub four minutes. And, and he was able to do it. And if you saw the ESPN special, he did it not just through physical training, he would visualize and see himself crossing the finish line, looking at the clock, and the clock says three minutes and 59 seconds. Because he knows what you know, that, is, that, that all, everything out here starts, starts in here, right? That it's not you'll see it, you know, that you'll believe it when you see it, it's the opposite. You'll actually see it when you start believing it. Because all behavior is belief driven, right? And so this exercise is interesting because, you know, every day you're visualizing things, you know, that you want to create that day, consciously or unconsciously, or you're visualizing the things that you fear or that you want to avoid, right? But we have to be we have to be careful with what we think because if you truly understood how powerful your mind is, you probably wouldn't think something or say something you didn't want to be true. And that's not to say you have a negative thought and it hijacks your life and it ruins your life any more than eating you know, that one donut out there does. But if you eat that donut dozens of times a day, every single day, it'll have an effect. Same thing with, with, with our negative thoughts and positive thoughts, right? And so going back to this, the E, you know, like going by, let's actually step back. Roger Bannister does this. That wasn't the impressive part, you know, the power of the mind. What was impressive for me was what happened afterwards. Nobody could break a four minute mile. All of a sudden one person does it. What happens after that? Yeah, a bunch of people started to break the, f but now what happened? Was there a big evolution in shoe technology, training methodology, nutritional support? Where was the change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in people's, in their minds, right? So that, that's, that's why we, you know, that, that quote, if you believe you can or believe you can, either way, you're right. That's the power of your mind, right? So if, you're, if, you, if there's a stopgap between where you are, where you want to be, maybe it's a mindset issue. You have assumptions or attitudes about something that might not be true, right? Just like about how far you could turn. Going back to the, the be fast, I'm gonna go through rapidly. The E is exercise. And I don't mean physical exercise. I mean, even though physical exercise, uh, you know, moving your body we talked about helps you to learn better as your body moves, your brain grooves. But I mean, I mean putting things into practice because it's a lie that knowledge alone is power, right? There's a lot of people who know a lot of stuff that doesn't, they don't have power or performance, right? Knowledge at best is potential power. It becomes power when we what? when we apply it, when we, when we utilize it. So I just wanna remind you as we're, as we're learning this, some of it, you know, like if you wanna be better at remembering names, right? You know, and at time permitting, I would've done 100 numbers or, or, or every name and face, right? But it just takes more time, right? And so going back to this, like, like I'm good with remembering names and faces. I think it's very important in business to remember people's names. I think it's the number one business etiquette and networking skill there is, because how are you gonna show somebody you're gonna care for whatever you have to offer them, their family, their future, their health, you know, their business, if you don't care enough just to remember what? Yeah, their name, right? People, what's the quote? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You know, and remembering names is, is something that takes a little E, effort, right? Because practice makes what? Progress, right? And so I'm really good at remembering names, but I haven't gotten much better after I learned how to do it. You know, after 30 days of practice, once you know how to drive, you know how to drive, right? Once you know how to type or code, you know how to do these things. Once you know how to tie your shoes, you know how to do it. Same thing with your ability to read two or three times faster, right? Same thing with your ability to remember names or learn a language or remember facts or figures or formulas, right? Once you know how to do it, now how many of you would say like this would have been very, very valuable back in school? right, to be able to do this. Because you're even thinking like, does Jim still remember the number? And if you check yourself, I could go like, you know, two, one, go, go through it, right? Um, and so you could go in eight, six, four, three, five, zero, six, three, all the way, because when you understand how your memory works, you could work your memory, right? So it's not like, I'm, like a magician could do some magic, but there's always a method behind what looks like magic, right? They're doing something. Same thing with people who can know how to focus better. Same, same with people who could learn five or six plus languages. Same with someone who could read three times faster. Genius leaves clues, right? So the whole science of this is all about brain health, 
for limitless expanded, and also the, what, what they call meta-learning. Meta-learning is the science and the art of learning how to learn, right, which is the most important skill. And then so the E is, remember, you have to t put in effort, but the, so that's the bad news. The good news, it's not that much, right? After you practice something for what, 21, 30, maybe 66 days, you know how to do it, right? And so I want to I wanna give you some of these tips, but I encourage you to put some exercise into it, all right? Now, going into fast, I'm going to go through this really quickly. The F stands for, if you want to learn something faster, I would say it helps to start by forgetting. And you're thinking like, you know, Jim, you're the memory guy. Why would I want to forget? I think sometimes what slows us down is this idea that we know this already. Does that make sense? Because it's hard to learn something new if you feel like you know something already and you're certain about it. And so I, I say you have to empty your cups, right, to be able to put new information in because your mind is like a parachute. It only works when it's opened, right? And so even if you know what the subject matter happens to be, it helps to be able to entertain two new ideas at the same time, right? Because as human beings, you could do that, right? And, and then also, ju and then you just judge. You could judge by, by results. But I would say forget about what you know so you can learn something new. Also forget about distractions. Because how many of you find yourself day, day in and day out, you have to you have multitask to keep up? Raise your hand. A lot of multitasking, right? Now, now, now the research is showing that multitasking is actually a myth for the most part. Few people could really t pull it off well. It's kind of like texting and driving, right? Because what you're really doing is task switching, all right? You're actually not going from do this activity to this activity. You can't do two parallel cognitive activities at once, right? You could, you could walk, you know, and, and think about stuff. But two different thing, activities is very, very difficult. So you're, what you're doing is task switching. And I think you think, the thing you think you're gaining, which is time, you're actually losing. Because it could take anywhere from five to 10 minutes to regain your focus when you go from something to another thing. Does that make sense? Also, we work with a lot of doctors, and did you know surgeons make more errors during surgery, during operations, if they try to multitask, right? Same as we would if we were trying to multitask, texting and driving as an example. But not only that, if that wasn't reason enough just to focus on one thing at a time, losing time, making more errors, it actually burns a lot of brain glucose. Like the, you, when you are working on a specific cognitive task, a part, certain part of your brain is lit up. And then in order to switch that over, you have to shut this down and open something else up. It requires a lot of uh, sugar, a lot of energy, right? And so how many of you sometimes feel just mentally drained like through, throughout the day, right? You have this mental fatigue, maybe feel a little bit of burnout, maybe because you're trying to do too many things at the same time. And you'd be much more effective focusing on one thing. So I'm saying is forget about what you know so you can learn something new. And when you're here, forget about distractions, right? And just really kind of focus. Now the A in fast, stands for if you want to learn faster, you have to make it active. And I mentioned learning is not a spectator sport. One of the reasons why is because the human brain doesn't learn best through consumption. It learns better through creation and, and co-creation and cooperation, meaning that it's, it's an old model where a teacher is like pushing information inside your head. You know, it's, it's easier actually for us to pull information in and then pull it out you know, and, and being active. So how can you be more active in your learning? Like what you're doing, you're, you're taking notes to, to mitigate that forgetting curve. By the way, between, because I, I see people, what's your preference when you take notes? Is it digital note taking or how many prefer, or handwriting? How many prefer digital note taking? Raise your hand. Yeah, how many people prefer handwriting? So, okay. So when, when students are tested for the comprehension and retention, handwriting notes actually performs better. Um, now, if you could do both, that's great. So, like, digital is great for storing information. Digital is great for sharing information, certainly. Um, but there's something about handwriting notes. Part of it is also, most of you could type pretty fast. So you could pretty much type as fast as, as a speaker could speak. But you can't possibly handwrite that fast. So it forces you to get active and filter the information. You know, what's most important and what I'm hearing? How does this relate to what I know? You know, so handwriting notes. What I do is that whole brain note taking technique where I put a line right down the page and on the left side I'll capture, on the right side I'll create. So this is interesting. Your left side, and I'm oversimplifying this for the time, but the left side is more logical. Your left brain, your right brain is more creative. So left brain is like, on the left side you're gonna note take, you're note taking. On the right side you're note making. What's the difference? You're gonna write your impressions of what you're taking notes for. So you're like, 
How can I use this? How does this relate to what I already know? What questions do I have? That will go on the right side of the page because if you're going to distract yourself and you're going to mind, you know, you're, you're going to start like your mind starts to wander and drift away and you know, your imagination is going to take you there, I'd rather take you to the right side of the page. Right? So there's lots of ways of being active, taking notes, uh, participating in the Q&A, and, and so on. The S in FAST, this is a big one, state. Remember this, all learning is state dependent. What do I mean by state? It's like a snapshot of your mood, of your mind, and your body, how you feel. So the key, raise your hand again if you'd like to have a better long-term memory. Right? Raise your hand, most of us, right? Do this, do this and say it, right? So put your hand out and say information. Okay, everybody, one, two, three, information. And do this at home. Information combined with emotion become long-term memories. So that middle brain that we have, two of the areas that I want to highlight there, first of all, is your hippocampus. It looks like a seahorse, and the, the function is memory. And attached to that is this almond-shaped uh, part of your brain called your amygdala which is a, kind of like a switching station for emotions. So it's interesting that emotions and memory are so closely linked. And you know this anecdotally. How many of you, there could be a song that you could hear a few notes that could take you back to when you're a teenager, right? Or food or a fragrance that take you back to when you're a child. Because information by itself is forgettable, but when you tie emotion, it becomes unforgettable. The challenge is when we learn something in a bored state, because that's how most people felt back in school, right? They were either confused or they were bored. Now, on a scale of 0 to 10, what's boredom emotionally? 0, right? And if it's information times emotion and the emotion is boredom or 0, what's anything times 0? Zero? 0, right? And you wonder why you forgot the periodic table or things you learned back in school because of the emotional state that you were in. So you never want to learn. If you want to learn something faster, never learn it in a bored state. Now, who controls how you feel? Who, do, who controls it? Yeah, you do, right? Because you're a thermostat, you're not a thermometer. I just want to remind you that if there, there's a thermometer on the wall, a thermometer, what's its only function? It reacts, yeah, it just knows it, it reacts to the environment. Whatever the environment's giving it, it reacts. And sometimes human beings, we react to the economy, to how people treat us, to the weather. But some of the happiest people and more fulfilled people tend to identify more with a thermostat. A thermostat doesn't react to the environment. It gauges, it knows what's going on, the temperature. But what is it, what's the difference with the thermostat? What does it have the ability to do? Yeah, adjust and set a temperature. You know, and as human beings, you set a standard, you set a vision, a goal, KPIs, whatever it is, and what happens to the environment? The environment reacts to you, right? And same thing with your emotional state. You know, reminding us that we have agency about how we feel. You know, everybody has a to-do list. Do you have a to-do list? Yes. But you know, what if you started your day with a to-feel list? Like these are three emotions I want to cultivate today. Because here's a secret. You do not have emotions, you do them. So a big part of what we're talking about today is taking the, the nouns in our life and turning them into verbs. So you don't have focus, you do it. You don't have a memory, there's a process for memorizing. There's a three-step process for memorizing anything. Right? You encode it, you store it, and you retrieve it. Right? You don't have motivation. There's a process for motivating yourself. You do not even have energy. And you're like, Jim, this is the problem. I have no motivation, no focus, no energy. But you don't have energy. You generate energy. Right? There's a process for energizing yourself with the foods you eat, with the sleep, you know, managing your stress, and so on. So going back to this, you don't have feelings. You do them. Right? And so if you could cultivate like three feelings that you want to feel throughout the day and you express them, the behaviors take care of themselves. Right? And so like right now, this is the example. Going back to S, all learning state dependent, sit the way you be sitting if you had the feelings of excitement. If you're really excited about, about me being here right now, sit the way you be sitting if you're very interested. Now why do you even have to move? Right? <laughs> but notice though, you know that changing your physiology will affect your psychology. So whenever you want to learn something, be, be clear that if you're in a kind of a flatline emotional state, a lot of it's not going to be retained, right? And you can up your own emotion. And you can even gamify this. Like on a scale of 0 to 10, how excited and interested am I? And you say 3. And then you can say like, OK, I control my emotions. How do I make it a 5? And then you could change your body, put a smile on your face, think about something you're looking forward to. And you could just up that emotion, and you're more likely to remember the information better because you're encoding it with more, more sensations, more feelings. And then finally, the last letter, T, be fast, is teach. 
If you want to learn something way faster, learn it with the intention of teaching it to somebody else, right? Uh, if I was to share with you my favorite, uh, you know, speed reading hacks and you know, brain optimization sleep hacks, and you had to give a, a TEDx talk next week on it, would you would you focus better? Yes or no? Yeah. Would you take more thorough notes? You know, you ask more, more, more detailed questions, right? You would own that because you're taking advantage of something called the explanation effect. The explanation effect says that if you learn it with the intention of explaining it to somebody else, you're going to learn it better because when you teach it, you get to learn it twice, all right? So those are just, you know, simple six things to think about, you know, when you want to be able to learn a subject or learn a skill better. And, uh, you know, the reason I bring these up is, you know, these are so simple, it's common sense almost, but common sense is not common practice. Like, you, you know what you should be doing a lot of the times, right? You know movement is good for your brain, you know, but are we doing it? You know, you've seen this, the research probably on meditation and, and, and how it can manage your stress and, and get you out of that fight or flight, you know, and get you out of that chronic stress that shrinks your brain, but are, are we doing these things, right? So the reason I wrote this book is it's about three areas that you could always control because you control the controllables, right? The three things you could always control are three M's, your mindset, your motivation, and the methods you're using. You could always control H cube, your head, your heart, and your hands, right? And the, the challenge is in scary times, most people downgrade their goals to meet the current situation out of fear. When you shouldn't be downgrading your goals, in my opinion, to meet the current situation, you should be thinking, how do I upgrade my mindset, right? My beliefs, the things we talked about, your thoughts. Um, how do we upgrade our motivation, which is purpose, which is energy, which is small, simple steps? And how do you upgrade the method you're using to be able to meet the, those goals? Like the methods we're using right now for reading are just old. Like when's the last time you updated your reading skills? How old were you the last time you took a class called reading? Six. So as the difficulty and demand increased a lot, but we're still reading to the same degree as we were last taught, right? And so when I tell people that they could triple their reading speed, much like they could memorize, you know, I'd use numbers because it's ubiquitous, right? But you could apply that towards memorizing anything, then life gets so much easier. And so my message for people is that if knowledge is power, then learning is your superpower. Right? And it's a superpower we all have. It's the one power that we have. You know, like all creatures have a superpower. Right? You think about some creatures could fly, some creatures could breathe underwater, some creatures could climb, some are super fast, some are you know, incredibly strong. You know, but we, we're not any of those things, human beings. But because of the power of our mind, we can fly. Because of the power of mind, we can go underwater. Because of the power of mind, we can go super fast. We can do all these things because you know, we upgrade our technology, our apps, our phones, but when's the last time we upgraded the technology that controls everything, right, which, which is the human mind? And that, that's really the focus, the focus of the work. I want to leave you. I want to go into Q&A. Um, I do want to gift you this. Everybody who's watching, if we could put the, uh, the slide on. So this was the limitless model that I was talking about, the three M's you could always control. This is how I, I view everything when I'm coaching clients. And this is, 30, this is 32 years of me working with individuals, you know, and these are the entry points, either mindset, motivation, and methods. And then they cross into three I's, which is inspiration, ideation, and implementation. But what I really want to share with you is this is the gift. Um, and then can we do, maybe do some Q&A. The new book, Limitless, the, the first book came out a few years ago uh, during the start of the pandemic. And this book, new book, is new research and new tools to really thrive in a post-pandemic AI world, right? There's, there's so, much new so many new chapters on nootropics and using AI to improve your HI, your human intelligence. Um, and one of the th research I put together is something I've been using with clients for years. And I realized that just like there's personalized medicine based on your genetics, right, or personalized nutrition based on your microbiome, there's also personalized learning. That is not how smart you are, it's how are you smart. And we all prefer to learn something in a different way. And we think in a, in a certain way. And there are about four buckets or four cognitive types that I realize exist. And I, I, I associated an animal to each to make it very memorable. And if you think about code, C-O-D-E, those are your animals, right? Um, so the C is the fast acting cheetah. These are people who are fast implementers. They have strong intuition. They thrive in fast-paced environments. They can adapt to change. The O is your logical owl. 
and they love data. They love facts, they love figures, they love formulas, right? The, the D are your visionary dolphins, right? These are the creators. These are people that, that see a product or see a vision that maybe other people don't see yet. They're great at pattern recognition. They're incredibly creative. And finally, the E are your elephants. And these are your social beings that learn best through collaboration. They're extremely loyal. Uh, they have high levels of empathy and interpersonal skills. But once you know your brain animal, and you can take this quiz, it's free, there's nothing to buy. Uh, you could go here, your entire team honestly should do it. It will up level, I promise you, and you could go whatever metrics you have. And once you know your brain type and the brain type of those around you, you could optimize for it, right? Because a cheetah would invest differently than an owl, right? They would perform, and they would also read differently. So when you go through this, I give you a detailed personalized learning uh, track, a report, and if, depending on your animal, this is how you can read faster. Depending on your animal, this is how you can remember names. Depending on your animal, this is how you could focus better at work. Right? Does that, does that make sense? So this is the brain code. I'm going to go into conversation. And, uh, and I hope this really serves you. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Jim, thank you so much. That was, uh, that was great. The first, the first question I have for you, and then we'll take some um, Q&A both from online, we'll take one there, and then folks live can uh, line up at the mic. I'll just ask a few questions yeah, yeah, to start. Yeah. Um, first thing I'm curious about is you mentioned you expanded this in, in the age of AI and post-COVID. What does that mean and what inspired you to do that? Um, so the, the first book I wrote for with all methodology, the things that you want to be able to know, how to get to inbox zero, right? How to be able to read a book a week, how to be able to, to remember things. And I, brought, I wrote it in memory, honestly, of my, my grandmother who had those brain issues. And I think we're best suited to help people that we once were, right? And so for me, I really struggled with learning. So I was kind of also writing it to the, the nine-year-old self, yep. you know? Um, but I realized that people have had a pretty traumatic um, and, and uh, very dynamic past few years. And so we updated the book with new research and routines and tools and methodology to thrive in, in a hybrid environment, right? Uh, in, in, a, in a world where you really want to learn and in, lean into your what, what we call learning agility, which is a big chapter in the book. We introduced the new research, and, the, and it's really based on momentum. So we talk about three M's, mindset, motivation, and methodology. The new updated version is completely about momentum. How do, you, how do you unlimit those three areas to develop a certain level of velocity, right? So using AI to enhance your HI, your human intelligence, will give you greater momentum. Understanding your brain type will give you greater momentum, right? We talk about nootropics, you know, and I've never talked about that in over 30 years of my career, but human studies, you know, supplementation that can improve your focus, your mental energy, uh, you know, your ability to remember things, that will get, help support your momentum. But a big inspiration was I was uh, turning 50, um, so it's a different life cycle. It makes me reflect on, you know, my work. And also we had our, we had our first child uh, this year also as well. And so, um, you know, it, it deepened my commitment to really to the next generation. I feel like I wasn't very well prepared for the world, you know, when I entered the workforce uh, because of these lack of these skills and these simple things that you could do to, uh, to elevate your learning and also, also your life. Yep. Um, congrats on your first child. That's very exciting. Um, that, that makes me um, think about actually, you know, what you mentioned, which sounded like a very traumatic experience of uh, hearing as a child a teacher say, the boy with the broken brain. One of the things I'm curious about is you give a lot of awesome recommendations for more like the intellectual idea of being able to push farther. I'm curious how that advice changes, if at all, if the limiting belief you want to remove is something that is more emotional or something that's really like touched you deeply. Yeah, I mean, how many of you feel like you have some thoughts that might be holding you holding you back, if we're honest, right? And we, and we don't know where that came from. Uh, you know, usually imprinted through our experiences, through other people's expectations. You know, for me at nine, I didn't know I had a broken brain until, you know, you're pretty much a, bl a blank slate, you know, as a child until adults have to be very careful with their external words because they often become a child's internal words, right? And so, especially if there's emotion involved in that and we have trauma, you know, and our nervous system is, is locked up, it's really hard to change because, you know, we get, you know, we're wired for growth until something happens where we get a lot of pain 
and then we're wired for survival. Right, and survival likes to keep things the same because anything different could be uh, some form of, of threatening. And so, you know, we, we put in the book various resources to help us to be able to calm our nervous system. You know, everything from uh, EFT and tapping to for different forms of self hypnosis. Uh, I introduced some of my, my methodologies in there. Simple things you could do to change your identity and start looking for evidence that supports who you want to be like in terms of your behavior, if that, if that, may, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna ask one more, then I'll yeah. go to live stream and, and also um, also here. Uh, last question, you, I, I love the way you talked about how you know, emotion and information need to be combined together. I'm curious for folks who um, you know, hopefully spend most of their time in their passion zone and so the emotion is yeah. there, but still need to learn some things that are not you know, the most interesting thing. Yeah. Uh, are there ways to inject emotion yeah. into these things? I, I think part of this is perspective. I and mean, I like to gamify everything because I just, you know, I'm a gamer and I just, it just makes sense to me. But like I'm in the audience a lot of times because I spend my time at conferences, you know. Um, and when I'm waiting to go on stage, I remember sometimes there are different forms of speakers. Everybody has their own teaching style. And some, sometimes the way the teacher teaches is different the way you prefer to learn. When I'm talking about those brain animals and you miss each other, it's like two ships in the night that, that pass each other that don't even realize the other one's there. And so you have no connection with that information or that person. So I believe that there could be learning uh, challenges, but also teaching challenges also as well. But I also want to have ownership over it. So if I'm sitting there and I don't feel very excited about it, and maybe this person is boring everybody, right, through speaking on stage, I, I will literally do this inside my mind. I'll say, this is so fascinating. Like, how is this person boring hundreds of people and putting them to sleep all at the same time? <laughs> and I'll get curious about it, yeah. and I'll own my state, you know, because, you know, uh, I talk about this with, I got to introduce two of my modern day superheroes. And I talk about superheroes a lot because I, remember I said I couldn't read, I taught myself how to read by reading comic books. And that's kind of taught me how to read. Um, but I got to uh, meet, uh, spend time with Stan Lee. And we're going out to dinner and I asked Stan in the car, I was like, who's your favorite superhero? I need, I need to know. And he tells me it's Iron Man. And he says, Jim, who's your favorite superhero? And he had this Spider-Man tie. So I was like, Spider-Man. And without a pause, it's an iconic voice you hear, with great power comes great responsibility and you all know that right <laughs> but maybe I've been hit in the head too many times but I tend to when I read or hear I, I reverse things sometimes uh, even to today today and uh, I heard something different I was like with great power comes great responsibility and the opposite is also true Stan with great responsibility comes great power when we take responsibility for something we have great power to make it better and I think one of the most important things to be responsible for is how you feel like nobody can make you feel. I know, I know it feels real that people can make you feel a certain way, but ultimately we, we can always decide and we, we have agency. So I want to remind people that um, not to give up your sovereignty outside, that all of it starts with, with personal responsibility. Yep, and I love how the superhero theme comes through in your book. Uh, you have some good anecdotes in there. Okay, a uh, question we've got from the live stream is coming from Ulysses. Um, I feel my brain's working memory capacity varies a lot day to day, and caffeine does not really help me yeah. boost that capacity. So is there any exercise or routines that can help me consistently maintain a yeah. high working memory? No, no doubt. So um, I I'm gonna say, obviously, prioritizing your sleep will get you better memory, right? Because that's where short term is consolidated to long term memory. So all the sleep hacks, right? Um, including caffeine. I, I personally can't do caffeine past 2 p.m. because I'm very sensitive to it, so it stays in my system. But taking a brain break, so something called the Pomodoro technique, which is pretty well researched, that we could spend you know, about 30 minutes to 60 minutes after that at work, our, our focus, there tends to be a dip or dive in our concentration and our mental uh, endurance. And so taking a brain break, as I mentioned, to move, to hydrate, just staying hydrated will boost your reaction time, your thinking speed, upwards of 30% your brain is mostly water, even a 2% compromise of dehydration will, will create a cognitive impairment. And so hydrate. And I also use a brain break not only to move and to hydrate, but to do some deep breathing. A lot of people are sedated because their posture at work. They're like bent over on screens or they're reading like this. And the lower one third of your lungs absorbs two thirds of the oxygen, right? So it's even taking a brain break to kind of clear the mental cobwebs and do some deep breathing you know, alpha breathing, box breathing, Wim Hof breathing, there are all kinds of breathing techniques, yoga nidra can help clear your mind. Uh, in the book, we do talk about some of my favorite nootropics, uh, which could be brain boosting. Some of them include uh, creatine, 
uh, you know, most people associate it to bodybuilding, but it has amazing cognitive health effects, you know, and uh, with your mitochondria and your energy. Uh, bacopa, uh, lion's mane. Uh, there's also a coffee fruit extract, uh, which is the fruit that's usually discarded, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the processing, uh, that has a big cognitive uh, potential boost also as well. But um, there are a lot of act resources for us. Really what I'm talking about is your own resourcefulness. You know what I mean? Just like you have your ability. And most of the stuff is free. Getting sunlight, going for a walk, moving your body, doesn't cost anything. Yep, absolutely. Um, we uh, have time just for one rapid fire live yeah, yeah, yeah. question uh, right over here. Hi, yes, uh, Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, moving a little bit away from how do I remember things, I'm personally a public speaker. I know all of us here have stakeholders all the time where a lot of our success depends on them remembering what we're saying. Yeah. I notice you take a usage of a lot of sort of acronyms and even sort of the physical activity throughout the talk. Yeah. Any other sort of tips that we can use in our yeah, sort of day tricks? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I, I in when I'm when I'm speaking, I'm thinking like three things. I was like, what do I want people to think? What do I want them to feel? What do I want them to do? Yeah. Right. So I, that's my outcome, and I work backwards from that. I also ask the producers like, what would make this a stellar session for you? Like, or if I'm out going on someone's podcast, like Jason, I was like, you know, what would make this one of your favorite episodes? Just like when I wake up in the morning, you know, I don't grab my device. I think about like if I fast forward, do the same mental exercise. Imagine myself coming home and my wife asked me how my day was, and I was like, today was amazing. I crushed it today. And I say, what had to happen in order for me to feel that way? And I focus on those things throughout the day. So I don't do things just re kind of reactively. Going back to your, I'm thinking like, how do I reach their head, their heart, and their hands? And so, you know, yes, the, the anecdotes and the stories are great because they're sticky. You know, they kind of create like a little memory palace inside people's minds. You know, when I give them an acronym or some kind of structure, if I can get people moving and feeling or just uh, the occasional laugh, which I appreciate you laughing at my cheesy jokes, um, you know, I know they're, they're being touched emotionally. And then, you know, my hopes is when people leave, they'll try something brand new, like even just one thing. Like maybe they'll just, uh, they'll get the book and they'll read 20 minutes a day. Or just because they heard this conversation, they're just thinking about, like everyone do this, shake, shake out your hand. All right, everyone do this, make a fist, do this at home too. Put it to your, to your chin. Now where's your chin? Oh, right. <laughs> but, e but even this, focus is an exercise, right? And you know, doing simple, something simple like that gets an audience a reaction. It gets them to think about, like, are they really paying attention? It gets them kind of giggle a little bit. So I'm always looking how to be able to stack and use more of their nervous system because I know they're going to more remember it better. So you do it with, through stories. And, you know, I could do it with questions. I often say, like, how many of you do this? How many of you have trouble remembering names? How many of you, you know, want to be able to read a book a week? So it gets them kind of engaged. And I, and I think that's a starting point because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I start out even with my story about, you know, the ills and the challenges that I had and how I turned my mess into my message. You know, as Simon Sinek talks about, start with why, because people don't care how much you know, but they want to know why you do what you do. So it gets them kind of like buying in, into it a little bit, you know. But everything that I teach can be re reverse engineered because in order to be a good learner, you learn these things and you say, how can I apply this towards my teaching? Because that's why you want to learn anything anyway. You learn it because of what it could enhance your life, but you also learn it on how you could public speak and enhance others. Now, by the way, there are so many strategies in here. I, I train a lot of actors, a lot of the top TED speakers, how to memorize their talks. That, is, that comes across different. When you don't have to rely on a teleprompter or you know, slides, and you could you know, recall things from memory, there's a, you know, a couple ways that we use the memory palace a little differently than most people. Um, because it shows that, and that confidence leads to confidence. So many people, and I, I, I applaud you, have a fear of public speaking. You know, that's one of my two biggest challenges growing up were learning, and because I, I couldn't, I never had the answer, it was public speaking. We, and life has a sense of humor, because what do I do all the time? I just public speak on this thing called learning. But, you know, I feel like, you know, that we, the life we live are the lessons we teach, and one of the best ways of doing that is through communication. So when you understand that people um, have these brains, and they're not always logical, they're biological, right? Do you think about dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, we have this feeling chemical soup. So I just want to be able to touch their head, their heart, and their hands, and that's kind of the, you know, the outcome of, of my talks. Thank you so much, Thank appreciate you. it, yeah. Thank you, perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for joining us at Google, and thank all of you.